Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and today we'll have a look at a real-life incident that happened on January the 26th, 2023 where two Alaska Airlines Boeing 737s tail striked within six minutes of one another when taking off from Seattle's runway 16 left. The content of this video is going to be based on a report on this incident in the Aviation Herald and another report in the German magazine Flugrevue, both of which you will find linked in the video description below. The entire video content of this video serves demonstrational purposes only and does not aim to accurately recreate the incident that happened. So. On January the 26, 2023, an Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 9 with a registration November 941 Alpha Kilo performed the flight Alaska 801 from Seattle to Kona in Hawaii and departed runway 16 left when the crew noticed a bump and the cabin crew heard scratching noises at the back as the Aviation Herald describes it. The aircraft stopped the climb shortly after departure and returned to Seattle for a safe landing on runway 16 left about 40 minutes after departure. Just six minutes after the first 737 departed, a second Alaska Airlines Boeing 737-900 with a registration November 468 Alpha Sierra on a flight Alaska 887 from Seattle to Honolulu departed the very same runway when the crew also noticed a bump and the cabin crew alerted the flight crew to scratching noises from the back of the aircraft. This airplane returned to Seattle about 20 minutes after departure as well. Following this incident, Alaska Airlines immediately stopped all departures in their entire network with operations figuring out that if two tail strikes happen within six minutes from one another, something just has to be wrong. And this turned out to be the exact right decision. Now, what happened here is that we have the following situation. Same runway, same airline, almost same destination, and almost the same airplane. So operations control figured that can't be coincidence. And they sent a safety alert to their crews which basically immediately froze all departures and then operations control started to look into the problem and they actually found the problem in that a software update to the tool that the pilots used to de calculate the takeoff data had used a 20,000 pounds less weight. Now, apparently some cockpit crews recognized it but other crews didn't and that's how the two tail strikes happened within just that short period of time. Now, just after 22 minutes of being on the ground, Alaska lifted the operations ban and continued operations and five hours later the software bug has been fixed as well. According to Alaska Airlines, on the 26th of January, 30 out of 727 flights departed with incorrect takeoff weights and luckily according to Alaska Airlines the damage to the aircraft was minimal. The 737 MAX could actually depart four and a half hours after the incident happened and the 737-900 stayed on the ground for approximately 30 hours before resuming service. So that's the story. Now let's have a look into what probably happened and how we can prevent it from happening in the simulator. Be aware that anything coming in this video from now on is my very personal opinion and I do not claim accuracy in that this is what happened at Alaska, at Alaska and indeed I'm pretty sure that something else must have happened because what I'm about to tell you is how we try to prevent those errors from uh, happening in my airline, which probably is for a different sort of error than what has actually happened. But let's have a look into it. So here we are in the cockpit of the 737-900. I just quickly set it up for a flight from Seattle 16 left towards Hawaii, and these are some of the values that we came up with. Now. I'm going to quickly give you the values in kilograms over here, after that we're going to switch to pounds. 
so that both my European and my American friends are in the picture. In the video over here, we've got a takeoff weight of 84.5 tons with a zero fuel weight of 66 tons and fuel of 18.5 tons, which are the values that Simbrief gave me for this particular flight. Now, if we switch this one over to pounds, then let's have a look into the numbers we see then. The takeoff weight is 186.2, zero fuel weight 145.5 with a fuel of 40.5 thousand pounds. Now, according to the report, the takeoff weight has been calculated at 20,000 pounds too little. Now, there is indeed an issue in the Boeing OPT that if you update your uh, database, you need to restart the tool in order for it to calculate the weights correctly. If you don't do that, then errors can happen in the weights. And part of the reason why we cross-check the captains with the first officer's data in the pre-flight is to catch an error like that. Now, the next step to prevent errors like this from happening over here is something that we do right within the oh, in the OPT. Now, let's have a look into virtual performance tool to show you the SOP we are using in my airline to trap errors like this. So over here, what we do is we would go ahead and first of all, read out the entire data. So Taxiway at 74068, takeoff 73873, landing 59373, zero fuel 55568. And then the colleague would compare it to his data, and then we would end up taking the zero fuel weight as it is over here. Now let's switch back over to the airplane so that we can um, see that in action. Now I'm just gonna turn this thing to kilograms once again because my OPT is uh, calculated in kilograms here. So we would now go ahead and go to the performance tool and we'd say, okay, so zero fuel weight, 55.6. And then we'd compare it to the zero fuel weight we have in here, which is 66.0. So 55.6 versus 66.0 is a huge difference. And we would try to figure out the reason why we have a difference of almost 10 tons over here. So Possible reasons could include, for example, that you have a hundred missing passengers, stuff like that. You try to figure out a reason. But with a difference as huge as it is over here, we would probably go ahead and immediately look at, well, 10 tons difference, there gotta be something wrong and there gotta be something big wrong. So that is the first thing where we would spot a possible error. Now. From here on, let's say that we agreed that we just wanted to use this weight. Then we'd go ahead and we'd see, okay, zero fuel weight, uh, sorry, gross weight, 74.0. And we would once again go ahead and compare that to the flat planning tool. And in here we have 74.1 indicated as the taxi weight. That is within 200 kilograms of the weight that is shown in the FMC. And that would serve as a gross check to make sure that the new growth weight shown here in the FMC is actually correct. Now, why might this be wrong? For example, if you'd entered a planned fuel over here, for example, because you wanted to um, complete the departure briefings while the refueling has not been complete yet. Anyway, there may be many possible differences here and we are looking to be within 200 kilos with growth weight and the operational flight plan. Now, once we executed that, we would, of course, calculate the takeoff data, and then we'd go ahead into the numbers that we have here for the um, takeoff speeds. So, the numbers we see entered on the right-hand side up here are actually the um, speeds for the correct takeoff weight. So, this is actually for the 20,000 pounds more. Let's go back to a pound display here since the original airplane was in pounds. And the numbers we see on the left from the QRH here are actually the numbers for the growth weight that we've entered into the airplane. So if we just about have a look again, let me just erase the um, speeds we have on the right side there. So these are the numbers that would have been entered incorrectly. 
Now, I don't know the SLP at Alaska, how they determine their takeoff data. I'm pretty sure it is going to be different from what we do in my airline. So, obviously, there may be different reasons why the error in the weight has not been trapped by the crews. And I'm sure that is going to be analyzed by the um, either the airline themselves or by an official investigation. So, keep that in mind. However, what we can determine over here is that we have takeoff speeds that are approximately 10 knots less than the actual speeds appropriate for the condition the airplane really was in. So let's go ahead once more and now enter the correct weight. So this is 20,000 pounds more. If we enter that, all of a sudden we get speeds that are approximately 10 knots higher than what they would be in the um, incorrectly calculated scenario. But okay, now let's take the lower speeds here. We said we had 122,000 pounds zero fuel weight. Now let's take the lower speeds. And keeping that in mind, we are going to do the takeoff and we'll see how easy it is to tail strike the airplane with incorrect takeoff speeds entered. So let's go up here, unfreeze that simulator, and off we go. Now, Microsoft Flight Simulator is not 100% accurate with aerodynamics in the low speed regime, so chances are there will be a little deviation and I wouldn't be surprised if we were actually able to take off over here, even with those incorrect speeds. In real life, let me assure you that even a few knots of speed difference can make a major difference in the tail strike angle. Keep in mind, with flaps 5, the tail clearance of the 737 is in the region of approximately 50 centimeters only, so if you are 10 knots slower, then your margin decreases drastically. But okay, let's go ahead here and start our takeoff. And keep in mind, I do not claim accuracy that this is actually what happened in the real life Alaska incident, but rather this just serves a demonstrational purpose for you guys watching this video. Okay, timing, set takeoff thrust. Also keep in mind that I did not do any precise takeoff calculation for the purpose of this video. So obviously with the lesser weight, the takeoff thrust calculated would also been a, have been a lot less than in the simulator as we see right now. And that's our tail strike. Off you go. Europe. And obviously from here on, you would follow the tail strike procedures and the appropriate scenarios. And eventually the crews returned to land safely at Seattle Airport. So let's have a look at how that looked like from the outside again. When we go to the outside to have a look at what's happening during that tail strike, the first thing we're going to notice is the tail skid that we find installed on all the 737-900s and also on the 737 MAX 9s. Now, I've covered the tail skid in a separate video, which I'm going to link in the description below, so I can very much recommend you to have a look at that if you want to have a look at the exact dealings with this thing. Now. What you're about to see is not 100% accurate in how a tail strike would look in a real Boeing 737 simply because of limitations with our beloved flight simulator. However, nonetheless, let's go ahead and view this as it happens. We're just about setting takeoff thrust over here and we are starting the acceleration down the runway. Now, with the lower weight used for all the calculations, we would have less thrust available to us or takeoff thrust would be less than what it would actually be for the real weight condition and of course our takeoff speeds are less as well and the result of both of these are what you're about to see in a couple of seconds happening which is when we rotate the plane it simply has insufficient lift available and thus the tail hits the runway now in the case of both of those 
flights, they did some calculations in the aftermath and they determined that the takeoff thrust that was actually used on both aircraft would have been sufficient for the performance of the flight and they did meet all the safety margins required to climb out from the runways. However, it was insufficient data to rotate the airplane without encountering the tail strike. Now, if you ask me for my opinion on this accident, then my opinion is that Alaska Airlines did exactly the right thing in shutting down their operations until they were sure that the problem could be solved. There is an article in the Seattle Times that I'm also going to link in the video description below, which goes over the details of what happened internally after these tail strikes and where some of the Alaska Airlines staff on station that day are actually quoted as well. And basically they did exactly the right thing in that they pulled the plug and stopped the operation until they could figure out the problems. And within the scope of 22 minutes, they switched from using automatically calculated takeoff data to using manual data, which then avoided the problem. Now, of course, one could ask the question how this could happen with an automated system in first place and if those systems are not checked after they are being updated. And the answer to that is that they are being checked and if you reference the article in the Seattle Times you will notice that they did actually conduct these checks and the bug did not appear until the program was actually under a high workload. So. When they checked the program in the test scenario by calculating different uh, data for different flights, the bug would not appear because it only appeared when the program was operating under a very high demand, as would be the case in Christmas days on an early morning. So, that's the incident that happened on the 26th of, uh, this, of January 2023. Now... Thank you very much for watching. I hope that you've learned something in this one. Now do let me know what you think of this one. I'm very much looking forward to reading your comments and this is going to be it for now. Thank you very much for watching. If you do want to support the channel you can do so using the buy me a coffee link in the video description below or by becoming a channel member which is going to give you exclusive early access to new videos before they are released to the general public. Thank you very much for watching and I'm looking forward to see you all again very soon.